Things get kind of complicated. Take off your mask, put on your mask. <laughs> Make sure the microphone is on. There's a lot going on up here. Thank you for your patience. Wonderful. Well, today we're starting a sermon series called uh, When Jesus Asked. And um, we're going to be focusing on tough questions that, that uh, God and Jesus asked throughout this sermon series. But it's going to be wonderful because um, some, some of the times where I've had the, the, like I felt close to God are the times that I felt him speaking to me uh, in question form. And so sometimes when I'm uh, kind of whining and then he starts to ask me questions and I'm like, uh, I shouldn't be whining. <laughs> I have nothing to complain about. Um, but you will notice uh, throughout Scripture uh, the, the series of questions that God asks, and uh, hopefully it would be a blessing as it was for us to be preparing for this. So let, let's read um, the Scripture that is found in Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to be reading from verse 13 through 18. Um, so it reads... When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son, the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Awesome. Awesome. So Jesus, in the time of the Greco-Roman world, um, questions were very a, a part of life. Philosophers actually uh, leaned, in, leaned into the style of asking questions to develop critical thinking skills. Theologians of Jesus' time would ask questions and sometimes, um, and sometimes answer questions with another question, kind of like Jeopardy. <laughs> so... Do you remember when Jesus was found in the temple when he was only 12 years old? The Bible says that he was asking questions to the theologians or the, the experts in the law. Notice how humans develop cognitively. They start to ask questions, like when they turn three, and they ask, Why, Dada? Why, Mama? Why, Nana? Why, 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 right? In the educational realm, the Brazilian educator by the name of Paulo Freire, and I know we have some educators in the room, so you probably heard of him. In his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, says, in order to develop a critical conscience, one must ask questions. There needs to be dialogue versus uh, the banking theory, which is deposit and withdraw. Whatever I deposit, I withdraw in the time of tests or in the time of quizzes. So questions are, 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 are important, not only for our, uh, our development as human beings, but they were important for, to God. Carl Murphy in the book, thank you, Sandy, that loaned me the book, and kept me up all throughout the flight because I wanted to read the end. <laughs> Carl Murphy in the book, Inquisitive Jesus, makes note that it was Socrates that put the Grecian culture in his head by having a new approach of scholastic methodology. Instead of telling students what to think, he showed them how. He did, he did this by asking questions, public questions, to, to the complete shock of the intellectual elite. So in the Old Testament, we see uh, God the Father asking questions. Do you remember, do you recall the very first question that he asked Adam and Eve? He says, where are you? It wasn't because he didn't know where they were at or they were lost from his sight. He, he knows everything. 
But it was because he wanted them to realize how far they had strayed away from him. Other questions that he asked, he then asked, who told you you were naked? And then, why has your continence fallen? What is in your hand, he asked Moses. And then to Elijah, he asked, what are you doing here? To Ezekiel, he asked, can these bones live? What about to Jonah? To Jonah, he asked, is it right? For you to be angry? Oh, not to mention Job. It was, it was almost four chapters that he goes on in, in a series of questions, and he questions, um, um, Job's questioning God. And he says, in just a, a couple of uh, verses, he says, Who is this that darkens the counsel by the words without knowledge? And then he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who sets its measurements since you know? <laughs> so there's different types of questions, right? Some of the questions are closed questions. Some questions could be open-ended questions. Some questions could be probing questions. Some co questions could be leading questions, loaded questions, funnel questions, Recall the process questions, and then rhetorical questions, just to name a few. God loved to use probing questions. He wanted to use questions that would, that would reveal the intent of a person, that would, would make somebody think to, know, to, to be able to realize um, maybe something that God was doing, or maybe something they were, that they were about to do. So have you ever felt like if God was asking you a series of questions? Maybe it's to make you conscious or aware of something. Let's look at this passage because I think one of the most important questions that Jesus asked his disciples is, in, is found in this very passage. And it's the question that he asked all of us because we're disciples of Jesus. So notice that uh, Jesus, right off the bat, he asked them. He's been walking with them for about three years. And then he pops the question, who do men say the Son of Man is? And then they start to answer, like maybe, maybe kind of laughing. Oh, I've heard this and I've heard that. And then he asked a pointing question. But who do you say I am? And it is there where, where our faith, it, it is there where our, the foundation of our faith lies in. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to men? But more important, who is Jesus to us? So Jesus takes them into this remote place in the Jewish world uh, where King Herod named this place called Caesarea Philippi. It is believed that he named this place to maybe to kiss up to, to Caesar, and that's the Caesarea part, and, and, and something that he wanted to name his, 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 uh, uh, um, a part of him, which is the Philippi part. But he takes him to this remote place, and, and, and actually the furthest part of the Jewish land, and it is this place that had, had, got, uh, had, had gone through many changes. It had gone through changes with the, uh, when the, uh, the, the Greek conquered that area, and then it went to some more changes when the Romans took over that area. It is this place where it was the southern and western base of Mount Hermon. This place was a place where multiple gods were worshipped in the Greco-Roman world, and specifically a god by the name of Pan. Pan was a god of the wild, god of nature, he was part man and part goat. And uh, if you see throughout scripture, sometimes uh, uh, goats are kind of uh, not seen in a positive light. Like in, in the judgment of the nations, Jesus says that he will separate the people one from another as, shepherds, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Goats are known to be mischievous, so this God was a, a mischievous uh, God. 
And, um, and he was known since he was worshipped there. They sacrificed goats in this place. And if we can see some pictures, well, that's him. Later on, in the syncretism of, of uh, Jewish religion and some of these uh, Greco-Roman gods, uh, it is those horns that they attributed to Satan. Because it was in this place that the actual gates of Hades were found. And it was a cave that, um, that was there. Go to the other one. So this is believed to be like the gates of Hades. And it was the, because there was um, sinkholes that had water. And actually water flowed in the time of Jesus uh, through that place. But these sinkholes were very, very deep. So they were known to be like the, the, the uh, water holes of the abyss. And it was known to be that that, that place was the place where the dead went. That was Hades. And that place was the place where uh, uh, spirits came out and did their spiritual activity. Now, I know that Jesus uh, didn't believe that this physical place was the gates of Hades. But since uh, culture around him named this place as the gates of Hades, I think Jesus did believe that there was spiritual activity that happened. And, and it was in this backdrop that Jesus answers Peter when he says, you are the Christ, the Christos, the son of the living God. And then he says, blessed are you, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood cannot reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. And he says, and the gates of Hades, and I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So I love it when the commentaries actually help you understand passages, right? So this, this is the backdrop where Jesus answers in this form, because it, it almost sounds like left field. Like, why are you bringing up the gates of Hades, Jesus? Right? And, I, and, I, and I'll try to give my explanation why I think. But first of all, what we can learn from this question is first off, the church of Christ is, is built on the declaration that Jesus Christ is the Christos, the Christ, the Son of the living God, period. Amen? Amen. If you believe me, why don't you give a round of applause just so, you, just so I know you're tracking with me. And if I can get a little preachy today, and maybe, and maybe kind of like the style of Latinos. All right. The church is built on this declaration. It's not built on a political party platform. It's not built on a nationalistic ideology. It's not built on a social economic status. It's not built on the good old boys club, an instrument to perpetuate patriarchy. It's not built on an organization that favors one race over another. It's built on the simple fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the Savior. He is the chosen one. He is the Son of the living God. In Romans 10:9, it says, you declare with your mouth that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the foundation of the church is declaring Jesus Christ as Lord. We honor Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And everything that the church does and, and proposes to do should honor Christ and him alone. Something else that this reveals is that this, quest, this question brings a blessing. Jesus answers Simon and he says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And notice, can you imagine in this backdrop? Maybe as Jews they felt a little bit uncomfortable, even though they were still in Jewish land. But there was so much, so much polytheism. There was worship of other gods. 
And then there was this hole that, that was believed to be the, the gates of Hades. And I think it's important. It's important that Jesus took them several miles to get there. It was almost like a, like a spiritual retreat for leaders. And he takes them to this place. And it was like, like, almost like a, a, um, a demonstration of what he was teaching. This is what the world thinks. But I am building my church on this declaration. Jesus, you, uh, Peter, you are correct. Flesh and blood cannot reveal, reveal, to this, reveal that to you. But my Father in heaven, and on this declaration, I will build my church. And the gates of hates will not prevail against it. Even though there is no physical location where, where uh, spirits come and go and, and, and there's an entrance, I, I don't believe that's what Jesus was saying. But I do believe that Jesus was saying there does exist a spiritual warfare to, to uh, prevent the church from growing, to prevent the church from doing what it's called to do. But if we are Christ-centered, if we do everything that Jesus did and try to live like Jesus taught us in his Gospels, then again, as a Latino, there ain't no devil in hell that can stop this church. We are going to move forward in the power of God. And the blessing that we have is that we know who Jesus is. And if you don't know, kind of like the, that famous deal, if you don't know, now you know. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you who he is. And I wish I had one of those pamphlets because then we can win a prize or something. <laughs> How come the kids get to do all the cool things? <laughs> Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is the Son of David. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, the Lamb of God, the bright and morning star, the great I am, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Rock, Emmanuel, God with us, Lagos, the Word of God, Kairos, Lord, Friend, Latros, which is a physician, Son of God, Messiah, Bridegroom, Paracleto, which is the Advocate, Redeemer, Bread of Life, King of Kings, Savior, Light of the World, Head of the Church, the Judge, Mighty One, our hope, our peace, Lamb of God, the way, the door, true vine, and the everlasting Father. Amen? Amen? That's the Jesus we serve. Those are the titles that were attributed to him. If the church is built on this, the church will move forward. And there's nothing that could come against this church. At first, when I, when I read this passage many years ago, I thought it was just a simple decoration of who Jesus is. But then Jesus answers with the spiritual attack that comes against this church. And it was almost like he's trying to give them a lesson of ecclesiology uh, to his disciples and how you know, the, the power of this declaration uh, can, can build his church and, will not, and nothing could come against his church. And I think it, it was a little bit of everything. And it was just two questions that led to this wonderful conversation. What might be God be asking of us? When we're going through situations, do you know who Jesus is? Do you know that Jesus is for you? In the time of stress and anxiety, do you know who Jesus is? It is those times where Jesus says, who am I to you? Who do men say that I am? But more important, who do you say I am? He is our Lord and Savior, our Jesus. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you're an inquisitive God and that you ask us questions. We thank you that that you, you take the time and you know all our thoughts. You know everything that we're going through. And at the right time, you ask those difficult questions. And it is in that process of answering those questions that we discover exactly where we're at. 
So Lord, today, may we know who Jesus really is to us. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He is your Son. Made, not made, but existed in the same likeness of you. Forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.